Coming up, a woman's struggle with self-worth sends her on a quest for something more. And Faith helps an undrafted long shot make it all the way to football's Hall of Fame. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada, and today's theme is Can God Give Me Strength? And I, I sure hope so, because I need it a lot of the time. Yep. Have you ever needed God's supernatural strength, Adia? Oh my, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Yeah. in so many ways. Um, quickly, I had surgery okay. to remove my thyroid, and um, when I came out of it, I was told I would never speak again. And I'm like, okay, God, you are my strength. Wow. So for six months, no voice, I was determined, God, you are my strength. And it surprised me, it surprised the doctor, it surprised everybody, and here I am today, still being surprised. That is amazing, <laughs> using your voice for this. You got that it. That is incredible. Yeah, well, I do believe in God's supernatural strength. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes we just take it for granted it's mm -hmm. there. But today, may you know God's strength in your own life. Mm -hmm. Well, this is how Renee relied on God to get him through an unimaginable tragedy. Watch this. My wife was overjoyed when she told me uh, uh, with the possibility of uh, having a son and uh, having our first child. I mean, we were ecstatic. Being married 14 years and numerous uh, doctor's appointments and visits, it brought a lot of, a lot of fear into my heart because uh, it seemed like every time an open door would come, it would close. And so uh, the possibility of having children was Pretty, pretty low, and if, if I have my son and he's in my arms and I hold him and I get to raise him, that'd be cool, that'd be awesome, and that's what I wanted. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it was almost like, oh, wait and see, see what happens. I knew something was wrong as uh, basically as soon as I entered into the house. The lights weren't on like they usually are, but that, that didn't raise too much of a concern. It was more when I came into the, into the house and opened the door and the door was unlocked, and then uh, the water in the kitchen uh, faucet was still running, and the, the chili and the lasagna were still cooking in the stove. So I knew there was something wrong because uh, that was at three o'clock when I left, and Julie would never have left something like that on for eight, eight hours. So. Uh, at that point, uh, I ran up throughout the house looking for her, and I found her in, in, the, uh, in the bathroom, and she was uh, curled over on the side with a phone in her hand. She had a, uh, a blue denim dress on, which covered her you know, entire body, so I didn't realize that she had given, began to give birth. I just thought maybe she fainted, hit her head, or might have had a seizure or something. And so, uh, so at that point, I um, tried to turn her over, and she was solid and stiff. And so, uh, I went downstairs. My neighbors were on their porch, and so I yelled out to them to call 911. And I ran across the street to get a nurse that I knew lived across the street. We began to do CPR uh, on Julia, and uh, we we tried as much as uh, as we could, and and. And uh, through the course of doing the CPR, uh, I noticed that there was, there was a taste of vomit from her mouth, so I, I knew something happened. And, and later on, I learned that she asphyxiated because she, she vomited, I guess, during ch giving birth because the child's head was crowning and she was dilated 10 centimeters, so she was in the actual process of giving birth. But I didn't realize that at the time. Neighbors all gathered because they thought we were gonna have a baby. You know, they were all like, hey, this is exciting. You know, it's happening now. And, and uh, I kind of said, no, I said, no, she, she's, she's not giving birth, she, she's, she may be dead. So I said, I said we need to pray. So I, I started praying and, and I, you know, praying at the top of my lungs, basically, you know, God, you can, who can raise the dead? I know you can raise Julia if, if this is your desire. And the paramedics came down and they said, Mr. Brochu, we, want to t we need to tell you something. And I said, is my wife Julia in heaven tonight? They said, yes, she is. And I said, were you able to save my son Summer or is he in heaven with his mother tonight? No, we weren't able to save him. He's with his mother tonight. And you know you're in your bedroom, and the clothes are all still there, and every the, the baby's room is done, and it was painted, and everything's there, and there's no baby, there's no wife, 
and then the reality of the loneliness became real. Though I never felt alone because I felt the presence of God, but the loneliness of missing this person who you could talk to. Uh, I refused to, 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 to stay in a place of uh, deep mourning where you're just caught in a depth of a pit or something like that. And, and I, I wanted to have my life uh, mean more than that. So what I did is I began a Bible study about a few months later in my home and uh, began to reach out to all people between the ages of 18 to 35, 40 single people. And it, it really was a healing thing for me to you know, get away from myself and to focus on other people and to share uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Have you ever been forced to wear your suffering? Here's what I mean by that. I, I think of Jesus and I think of the crown of thorns. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 28 to 30, we realize that the soldiers, before they crucified him, it says they stripped Jesus and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and they set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again and again. You know, thorns in the Bible are associated with curses and death and dying, pain, sorrow, and sin. And so the Roman soldiers placed a crown of thorns on the head of the one who would take on all sin and all pain and deliver us from this world of death. What's so fascinating about this story is that what the soldiers meant as a mockery of Jesus' claims to being a kid, king, instead demonstrated exactly who Jesus is. He is our suffering king. So let me ask you the question again. Have you ever been forced to wear your suffering? I thought a lot about thorns and I thought about a rose bush, that yes, rose bushes are incredibly thorny and they can be painful, but they can also produce something beautiful. And on the cross, Jesus took your pain and suffering and he produced something beautiful, your freedom, if you'll accept it. And if you need freedom, you need Jesus to take your pain today, I wanna to invite you to pray with me right now, a simple prayer. Would you do that? Would you just close your eyes with me right now and pray, God, I recognize today that I find myself in a place I don't wanna be. I am suffering. But today I also acknowledge that you are the suffering king. So I ask that you take my suffering and transform it in your power and in your love into something beautiful. I give my life to you today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, after the, after the break, a broken childhood takes Fatima on a journey of self-discovery. Watch this. Hello, my name is Michelle, and I'm a prayer partner with 700 Club Canada. We have an amazing team waiting to pray with you, and we're available every day. We want to make it easy for you to connect with us. All you have to do is pick up your phone and call us at our toll-free number, 1-855-759-0700. And don't forget to let us know how God answered your prayers. We want to celebrate in your victories too. Our number again is 1-855-759-0700. We look forward to connecting with you today. As a little girl, Fatima McRae wondered what her life was worth. Her father was killed when she was one year old. At age four, a family member began molesting her. The abuse continued for three years, and when she was seven, she lost her mother to breast cancer. I felt insecure because I felt like I didn't know who I was, where I belonged. I felt depressed because of what I had experienced, and I felt fearful that my life would always be how it was. She moved in with relatives, but didn't feel loved or welcomed there. Meanwhile, she was still haunted by the trauma of molestation. As a result of me being molested, when I was 10 years old, I began to have sexual dreams about women. They were like lucid dreams. They made me question who I was. Over time, she developed an attraction to the same sex. 
when I was 14, a young lady actually approached me um, and she said, you know, I've seen you around school and uh, I, do you want to be my girlfriend? I think you're attractive. Do you want to be my girlfriend? And I thought, well, now is the time to act on everything that I've already been feeling. So that's when I started um, same-sex relationships. Fatima embraced a bisexual lifestyle and also began hanging out late, drinking, and using drugs. After graduating high school, she joined the Marine Corps and hoped for a fresh start. While I was still struggling with who I was, while I was still struggling with um, self-worth, I reached a breaking point uh, in the Marine Corps. I, I became a functioning alcoholic, drinking um, full party-sized bottles of wine on a Wednesday night, cup for cup, and then going to work the next day. And it was so crazy because everyone thought that I was the party girl and that I love life. But those people are usually the most broken. It's a compensation thing. And then when they're by themselves, they can't even stand the sight of themselves in the mirror. And that's how I was. After several injuries, Fatima received an honorable discharge. No longer a Marine, she thought her life had hit rock bottom. She was hopeless. And her cousin invited her to church. And he said, Fatima, don't you want more? And little did he know that's exactly what I had been looking for, was more, more of life, more. So I went to that young people's service and I went in there reeking of vodka from the night before. So I, I can't even remember uh, the message that they preached, but I remember the feeling that I had and I felt the presence of God. And for me, that presence made me feel like it felt like home. It made me feel like I'm, I'm supposed to be here. During the next service, Fatima heard a message that changed her life. Through the new birth experience, you become a new creature through Christ. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. So when I heard that written in the Word of God, and I said, okay, well, if it comes to being baptized in Jesus' name, to wash away the things that I've done, and to even arise in the newness of life so that I don't have to be the person that I used to be. I don't have to be bound by what I used to be bound by. I'll do it. Fatima realized she can be victorious over addiction and temptation. Asking the Lord to be a part of my life, to be in my heart, to be the ruler over my mind is a continual walk. It started at baptism. It started at receiving the Holy Ghost. But it's a continual walk day by day because things are going to continue to come up. Keep the flesh under subjection. Though I may be tempted, I can overcome that temptation. So the same-sex attraction isn't completely gone because we're going to be tempted, but I have power over it now. In Sunday school, Fatima became friends with Ronald. He had also left the homosexual lifestyle. She was the main person who spoke into me and reaffirmed me as a man when I was questioning whether or not I could do this walk with Christ, you know, and be transformed. And she saw a leader in me before I even did. Their relationship blossomed into romance, and they married in 2015. And in 2019, Fatima gave birth to their son, Alexander. In moments like this, she is simply amazed. I never thought that I would be here. You know, I never thought that I could have someone who can really empathize with me, someone who would really love me. After all that I experienced, I didn't even love myself, but God gave me someone who sees all that I've experienced. The things that I felt would uh, bar me from being a candidate for marriage. He saw and he said, I wanna help you heal there. I don't think I would have ever been here uh, had it not been for the grace and mercy of God. I'm, I'm grateful that God saw fit to not only die for me, but to, to show me a life that I never thought that I would be able to have. You know, Adia, I just love stories like this because mm -hmm. I think so many of us, if we're totally honest, yes. at many times in our life, just feel hopeless. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves in a situation and we ask, can I ever be free from this? And when we hear stories like this, it reminds us that there's a God who sets us free. Yes. And yes, it, Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble. Mm -hmm. But he also said, take heart, I've overcome the yes. world. And you've seen this, haven't you, mm -hmm. in so many ways in your life? Yeah. In fact, um, like my reliance is in him. Right. Because it doesn't matter how good I think I am or saved I think I am, mm. I cannot do it without him. Right. End of story. <laughs> yeah. Well, you I know? think that's so true. And I think so many people, you know, they try to do it on their own. Yes. And actually, 
sometimes it's like trying to dig a hole in quicksand. The, the more you dig, actually, the deeper you sink, yes. and or the, even the more you struggle. Mm -hmm. And so we need someone to pull us out. Yes. And I love the hope that we have in Jesus because mm -hmm. He pulls us out. Yes, always. You know, and, and you cannot depend on you. Right. That's what I come to realize. I cannot depend on me. He said his mercies are new every morning. Right. Great is his faithfulness. So I have to rely on that 24-7. Yeah. So, okay, really practically, though, because people are like, <laughs> yeah, I want that. Yeah. How do you do that? How, okay. have you, how do you do that practically yeah. every day going, I'm going to trust you, God, and not my circumstance? Yeah. So what I do is I make him first priority, okay. which means I get up an hour earlier, even though I don't want to. Okay. And I say, Lord, here I am. Mm. Show me what I need mm. in my life now. That's good. And give me understanding as to how to go about my day. Because my day is still not about me. It's about him. And mm. I say, here's my hand. Use it for your glory. You're my eyes, my, my ears, my heart. Use it for your glory. I love and that. Because that, that's how I'm going to stay filled up, right? I love that because, again, the book of James says it's like a mirror. Yes. You look in the mirror every day and then let God show you yes. what you need to see. Let mm -hmm. God define mm -hmm. you. And if there's anything that needs to be corrected, let yes. him do yes. that work. And so that's available to you. I want to encourage you to call us right now. If, if you need someone just to pray with you, speak life over your life, we are here for you because mm -hmm. God is fighting for you. He can change you today. Well, now, these are life lessons from Football Hall of Fame Donnie Shell. Donnie Schell flashed his medal as a playmaker for the famed Steel Curtain defense. It's been a long journey, but a good one. I arrived in Pittsburgh in 1974 as an undrafted free agent, and now I'm in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Only God can do that. The four-time Super Bowl champ and three-time first-team All-Pro spent his entire 14-year career as a Pittsburgh Steeler, steered there on the advice of his college coach. I'm going to sign with the Denver Broncos as an undrafted rookie. And I went and talked to Coach Willie Jeffries. He said, and very emphatically, you need to go to Pittsburgh. I said, well, why, Coach? Well, that's your motive. They love people who are committed, self-motivated. That's your MO. You need to sign with Pittsburgh. As a mentor, advisor, and leader, the distinguished strong safety earned his master's in counseling as faith transformed his life. So a three-decade wait to reach the Hall of Fame. Releasing something look different to you? Yeah, the longer you wait, the longer you think you're not going to get in. But it caused me to reflect on my athletic life. I said, Lord, I had a good career. I thank you. What he did by that way, he changed my attitude. Let your will be done. And then when I let it go and let God do his work in my life, he gave me some things that I've been praying for all those years. How do you come to terms with that? Spending time for the Lord and in His Word, reading and meditating on His Word, and walking in obedience to Him. And as you putting things inside of you, and uh, the Holy Spirit is processing it, and it causes you to grow and, and think God thoughts. A specialty in laying a person out on the field. <laughs> Did you ever play with a temperament? Look at this face. <laughs> you have to think something <laughs> kidding, that kidding out. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have an on-off switch? <laughs> no, um, it's just like a horse, a wild stallion. And yet, a good trainer will get that horse and domesticate him and make it and train him. They don't come any tougher than strong safety, Donnie Shell, number 31. He didn't take his aggressiveness away. He didn't take his strength away. He didn't take none of his power away from that horse. He just under control of that person who trained him. So that was me. I was under control of the Holy Spirit, using my gifts to the maximum. Mel Blunt mentored you, a teammate. You came alongside a young Tony Dungy, and mentored him. How does that speak to you about the power of investing in people where their reach goes far beyond you may even be able to reach? I, I think it speaks volumes. That's what happened to me in my life. Somebody saw something in me that I didn't see. Like my high school coach, Coach Lefty Johnson, he said, you can be whatever you want to be. So when we see something in people where they're young or old, we need to encourage them to be all God created them to be. First, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for this award. Your work fosters relationships to heal and reconcile. For you, where does that transformation start? Oh, it has to start with you, yourself, inside. 
the scripture said, if, if you don't forgive those that trespass against you, then the Father will not forgive you. So it starts with you. I guess that's where my counseling degree comes in. And you listen to the other person intently, compassionately about their concerns. As a counselor, Donnie, do you gravitate to the description of him as wonderful counselor? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's my source. That's my strength for wisdom and guidance and direction. And I pray every day that I may meet someone that I may share Jesus Christ with or be of encouragement to someone today. A man prayed that prayer for me, and that's the way I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. What's most important to you in shaping a legacy while you still have the opportunity to define it? Be a servant leader, one who's motivated by love and humility, but demonstrated by example. We change as we grow in Christ. We change on the inside out. So people will see less of us and more of Jesus Christ. That's the legacy I like to leave. If you're a follower of Jesus, you probably want to experience more of him in your life and you want God to use you to make a difference, right? Perhaps you're even trying to do all the right things, yet you're not experiencing joy or even fruitfulness. Well, I want to encourage you and give you the key to living a life that God uses for his glory, for your good, and so the world will see Jesus. And here it is. It's found in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God isn't looking for the most talented or gifted. He's not looking for those with lots of connections or money. He is looking for one thing, those whose hearts are fully committed to him. No matter where you've been, what you're afraid of, or what sin is in your rear view mirror, God can still use you to make a difference. What he needs from you is a total commitment to him. God wants you to be all in on his plan for you. This isn't about your ability. It's about your availability. At an early age, I told God, I'm all in. I don't care what you ask me to do or how tough it is. I, I'm going to say yes, anytime, anywhere, any place. In fact, I remember walking an aisle in my church in response to an altar call at 11 years old and signing a card with those very words on it, anytime, anywhere, any place. I didn't know what that would mean, but I can assure you that God saw my heart as a young girl and has answered that prayer over and over again in my life. And it's been a great adventure riding, doing, just riding with God and doing what he wants me to do. Notice in this verse that God strengthens you when you commit to him. He doesn't expect you to do anything alone. That's why he gives you the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. This is the source of power that Jesus himself used while on earth. That same power is available to you and to me. So what are you waiting for? You can make that same decision too. The Bible says God is looking for people to use to change the world. He's looking to you, yes, you, to be a world changer. And it all starts with a committed heart. You can start today. Let God know you're committed to doing whatever he wants with your life. Tell God you want him to use you and then watch how he answers your prayer because that's courageous living. I would just like to personally thank all of you who support this ministry faithfully so that we can tell the amazing stories of what God is doing around the world. 
And if you're not a partner with us, I'd like to invite you to consider that today. Why don't you call today and become a 700 Club monthly partner? And if you do that today, you'll receive this incredible resource called the 10 Laws for Success. There's a workbook, uh, and they are free as our gift to you when you become a partner today. And in them, you're going to learn how you can experience success in your work, in your family, in your finances, through God's kingdom principles. And who doesn't want that? And you'll also receive our monthly newsletter entitled Frontlines. So why not give us a call today at 1-855-759-0700 and be a partner with us in this amazing mission. Thank you in advance. Get 10 Laws for Success from CBN. Featuring Pat Robertson's signature book, plus a brand new study guide. 10 Laws for Success will give you the tools you need to live with godly purpose and power. Learn how to practice life-changing principles such as the laws of use, change, and responsibility. Put the laws of God's kingdom to work in your life. Get 10 Laws for Success today. Call or go online now. Adia, today I have needed the reminder that God can give me strength. Yep. I've learned this in my physical body. Like when I'm feeling a little bit weak or fatigued, sometimes yep. just eating something or drinking yep. something will re-nourish uh, my body mm -hmm. and give me strength. But it's the same in our spiritual life. Yes, if we don't pay attention to it, mm -hmm. eventually that diminishes and we need God to infuse us again. And mm -hmm. maybe there's those watching who need that. What are some of the ways that you just feel God's strength and how do you get that again? Yes, yeah, so for me, when I'm going through that, I say, Lord, I need your strength. Right. You are my strength. You are my peace. You are my joy. And because you are, I'm pulling from you. Mm. And then I rest. Well, I love that about you because I know you are really big into proclaiming the truth. Yes. And that's how you nurse. You speak it, even yes. maybe if you don't feel it yes. or have a hard time seeing it, right? Yes. And prayer. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think just acting on it. Act yes. as, one thing I also love about you is you act as if it is, right? Yep. <laughs> that is, yes. you've inspired me so many times on that. Yeah, act as if it is. Mm -hmm. So pray, speak the truth, and act as if it is. And speaking yes. of prayer, we get to pray uh, for a couple of prayer requests today. Yuri said, I ask you to pray that the Lord will support me and call me that he would deliver me from all my negativity. That's a great prayer request. Yep. And Mark says, I'm asking for prayer for help with my depression. Now, the very first thing you did was own that depression. That's not yours. Uh. So you say the depression because as long as you own it, it's yours. Oh, yes. So we're just going to pray and just believe God to uh, remove and to reverse that in Jesus' name. So, Father, it. we ask you right now that, Lord, that you would touch mm. and heal and bring deliverance and calm and yes. peace to the hearts and to the lives of um, your people, the ones that are crying out, Lord. You said, your scripture says, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all mm. his troubles. So whatever troubles they're facing today, God, mm. depression is not theirs. Um, fear is not theirs. So in Jesus' name, we ask that those be broken right now and that they'd be set free once and for all in Jesus' name. In amen. Jesus' name, amen. So go in God's strength and power. Pray, trust the promises, and live as if it is so. Thanks for watching. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. On the next 700 Club Canada, a woman shares how she was miraculously healed from cancer, and the power of prayer overwhelms a young family.